connections. And this will be in the buildings category. And for, for the people who have not been participating yet, I know this is kind of quick and even for the people who, who have seen some of this before, it's not that easy. But what, essentially what you do as part of this eco challenge is you, you select actions and then you complete the actions. So Allison's action, um, hey Bill, can you let Greg Wood in please? Allison's action is explore other building solutions. That is what we're learning about today. <clears throat> so I am going to select this and I'm gonna say, yeah, this is gonna be about 50 minutes of learning. And I'm going to add that. See, it shows, oh, I selected this action, yay. And now this action will be part of my dashboard. So I'm gonna to go to my dashboard and I'm going to pretend that we are already one hour from now. And here it shows up on my dashboard as an action that I've selected but not completed. But now I wanna complete it. So I'm gonna hit the button and it's gonna say, how many minutes did you spend learning? And I'm gonna say 50. I spent 50 minutes learning about other drawdown building solutions. And yay, you did it, Doris. See, congratulations. So now those minutes spent learning that I showed earlier under impacts has now been increased by 50. And that is what all of us um, should do, as well as everyone who will be seeing this recording and encouraged to do so before the end, because we want to get to 10,000 actions so that our collective, uh, our collective drawdown footprint is huge and representative of who we are as Unitarian Universalists. So well, I'm Allison Kendall. I'm a, a longtime member of the Unitarian Universalist Community Church of Santa Monica. And actually before that, I belong to the Palo Alto UU Church um, pre-2003. <laughs> Um, and even before that, lived in Pennsylvania, um, the UU uh, Fellowship of Center County. I'm a licensed architect and a planner. I've always had a strong interest in environmentalism and in doing whatever we can to address um, environmental issues and increasingly the, the dominant issue being, of course, climate change. So my own practice is very much oriented around sustainability and, and uh, architectural design and, and as well as uh, city planning for sustainability. Wonderful. What I want to talk to you about today is the role of building design and the potential of green building and green home remodeling to really meaningfully affect um, our climate and our goals as environmentalists. So um, I, I'm just curious to, at, at the outset, how many of you show of hands are homeowners? Good, so this is gonna connect, okay, with a lot of you. It is something in your, um, it's a little bit different if you're a renter or if you're a condo owner, it's a little bit more complicated, but Many of these things are things that we could be promoting and that really do have an impact. Some images of green buildings and what we can do with them. Um, so in my practice, we, um, let me get this slideshow going, here we go. We do a, a mixture of new building design and green building design. And one of the interesting challenges that we have in an area like the west side of Los Angeles, which is where most of my projects happen, is that uh, most of the uh, buildings, most of the homes in this area are old. They are up to 100 years old, and they are generally of very poor quality, <laughs> I would have to say, despite their absolutely phenomenally high price. Um, so some of you in Palo Alto can relate, I think. Um, 
So they're, they tend to be old, they tend to be drafty, they tend to have been built um, a long time ago and then have been modified many, many times in the interim with the end result that they're, um, they're sort of like a car that was added onto and completely transformed about you know, 50 times and they don't work very well. Um, now the, that is increasingly there is more and more new construction and that gives us an opportunity to build in a whole new way. So I'll be talking about both strategies um, because both of them are important to us. So the project on the, on the uh, slide right here is actually, it's on a single family home lot and here in West Los Angeles, as in many kind of uh, inner city areas, the lots are very small. They're, um, this is a 5,000 square foot lot. And the project is actually two homes. It's not obvious, but there's one town home in the front and one in the back and a total of two garage spaces, each for one car with space for an additional car in front. So this is a, ver a much denser housing type than we've seen in older development. And this is the key in many ways to achieving some of our goals as environmentalists to reduce transportation, to save resources, and in particular to save land and to get people living close to jobs and other resources. Um, so this is a project that's under construction right now in our office. Um, the other strategy, which probably makes more sense and is more accessible to most members of our congregations is um, remodeling existing homes. So here's the home of one of our congregation members uh, in Santa Monica. It's a downtown um, Los Angeles historic home, over a hundred years old, um, historically significant. Um, and the kind of projects that uh, somebody who owns a house like this, or even one that's half this age, can tackle easily are different, obviously, than the ones you can, um, you can kind of um, confront when you're building from the beginning. Um, but there are quite a few things that we can do. And in our congregation, we've really uh, pursued those um, aggressively as part of our Green Living Group. So the first one we have um, been big advocates of, despite living in Southern California, where frankly you could live in a tent and be perfectly comfortable, uh, is insulation. And the, the reason that matters here in LA is actually it gets uncomfortably hot occasionally. And so the place we really focus on is the attic, um, which is where you get a lot of heat gain. Um, but we have been big champions, literally it, the name of our role has been energy champions for a program called Energy Upgrade California, which is an excellent program, which I hope that uh, I can see Bill uh, nodding, he's probably familiar with it. Um, it's the kind of program that I'm hopeful that President Biden will be sort of reviving with plenty of funding because it promotes uh, attention to our existing buildings. And our existing buildings are essentially the gas guzzlers. They're literally natural gas guzzlers in California. In some other parts of the country, they might be guzzling oil um, or even electricity but they're not well insulated. They are not um, uh, well sealed. And often they have uh, heating and cooling systems that do not reflect the best and most efficient technology available. Um, so the thing that we uh, promote here in California, which is perfectly adapted to our climate is uh, heat pump air and cooling systems, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those. The other thing that of course makes sense actually across the country, but particularly in our sunnier parts of the US is adding solar photovoltaic panels to rooftops. So almost anybody across the United States um, will find that this is actually a net money saver in terms of a project. Um, there are some incentives 
to do it, but more importantly, it, it immediately basically takes a giant chunk out of your electricity bill and will do that for 10 to 20 to 30 years. Um, so an incredibly smart investment for any homeowner and a way that we can substantially reduce the amount of electricity that we are consuming and help to switch uh, the generation of electricity uh, from coal and very undesirable um, fuel sources to renewables. Um, here in California, a really important resource as well is landscaping. Uh, we emphasize saving water, um, and all, but also saving on mowing and maintenance because those uh, two-stroke engines that uh, roar around cutting the grass are very polluting. They're not very good for the health of the operators, and they're frankly just completely unnecessary. So most landscaping, unless it's being actively used by, by uh, children to play on, could generally be uh, replaced with a more appropriate to the climate landscaping solution. It could be a vegetable garden, it could be native plants, it could just be low maintenance uh, plants. Here in California, we have some really wonderful alternatives to lawns that have been used widely. Um, it'll be much more interesting, much more uh, accommodating of wildlife and save you a heck of a lot of time and money. So that's appealing, of course. Um, the other thing that I strongly recommend to people is replacing old appliances. And I get a lot of resistance on this because people tend to think, oh, I don't want to generate more waste by throwing out my 15-year-old refrigerator. Um, so I'll be thrifty and green and hold on to it. Or worse yet, I'll move it into the garage and then I'll have another newer refrigerator in the kitchen. Please do not do this uh, unless you're a, you know, a hunter and you need to store your deer carcass or something. Um, there's really no need for having two refrigerators. And in particular, it's really important not to hold on to very old appliances because they generally are consuming gigantic amounts more electricity. We've been very successful over time at making our appliances more and more efficient. And the newer ones are substantially more efficient, both in, in uh, energy and water use. So um, always check that it's Energy Star. Go beyond that um, if possible and check the CEE um, ratings and try to find the most efficient um, appliance you can find for the size and type you need. Um, we similarly pay a lot of attention to water here in the West and the whole Southwest. We really need to do that. Um, and so water sense is the, sim the equivalent to Energy Star. And you always, always should be looking for water efficient appliances. Ultimately, it's gonna save you on both energy and water. And of course, here in the Southwest, water is energy because it takes energy to bring water to the Southwest for our use. Um, and the, the last tool that I use a lot and that I'm gonna be talking about a little uh, later on is Greenpoint rating, which gives us um, a metric, a way of measuring how green our homes are. So there are several different um, green labels for homes. Greenpoint rating is one that we use. There's also LEED, many of you may have heard of L-E-E-D. Um, or Energy Star, or um, various others. Uh, there's Bream in, in Europe, and there's Green Globes, and there, there are a ton of them. Um, so all of those are really great tools for um, paying attention and making your home greener. Um, the other thing that you can do, which is very meaningful in terms of an environmental move, is to actually add a second home on your own piece of ground in the backyard, generally, for, um, it could be for an older relative, for a, a grown child, for a renter, or even just to give yourself some peace and quiet and studio space, but to provide the option in the future for uh, a second dwelling unit. Here in California, we have a wonderful piece of legislation that has made that much easier, mostly by taking away 
the obsession with providing additional parking for the for the second unit and many other parts of the country are thinking about that or doing that and we should be um we should be advocating that very strongly because this is a great strategy to put housing where it's really needed in our inner uh in our inner suburbs so this is a granny unit in santa monica california it's about a uh, thousand square feet it's two bedrooms two bath um but quite very compact. Um, it actually has uh, solar on the roof. Um, and it's in the backyard of a tiny little bungalow on a similar sort of 6,000 square foot lot, typical lot. Um, but very, very usable. In this particular case, it was a grandmother who wanted to be able to help out with the grandkids, but also have her separate um, unit. So great solution and something that really helps us with the bigger issues. Um, another strategy, of course, is to uh, renovate your existing home. This is um, a beautiful historic home, 1930s vintage near Beverly Hills that we um, are working on, just finishing up. Um, what was interesting here is we took a home from 1930s with a big uh, giant furnace, uh, completely wrapped in asbestos, completely leaky as uh, a sieve, typical for Los Angeles, um, with a very uh, minimal kind of non-existent, basically, um, insulation, again, typical for Los Angeles, and um, made the, restored the home essentially to its historic look, added some modern space for a kitchen and studio and bedroom at the back, which you're looking at, this is the backyard of the house, but blended it seamlessly with the older house and made the existing house and the newer parts much, much more energy and water efficient. Um, so this kind of approach can really work. In this case, we used that electric heat pump system that I talked about, which is perfectly adapted for our climate it, it just moves the excess heat on a hot day um, from inside the house to out, and on a cooler day, moves it from outside to inside uh, in an extremely efficient way that is um, far better than any of the alternatives available to us, and particularly in conjunction with solar photovoltaic panels, can be essentially a completely renewable heating and cooling system perfectly adapted to our climate and even with a filtration system that can be very useful in the increasing number of days that we have um, wildfires and smoke and concerns about air pollution. So a lot of great ideas there, um, all integrated into a um, renovation project that restored a historic home. Um, some of the most exciting projects I think in this area are, are those that really put substantial amounts of new housing right where it's needed. So this is an example when you have uh, not single family zoning, but R2 zoning in certain areas, for example, in Los Angeles, you can actually add two or even three units behind a single family home. So the Definitely the, the, the uh, contrast in scale is pretty dramatic. You have the stucco box, one story in the front, um, but potentially this could be really important. And this project, for example, is just a couple miles from downtown Los Angeles uh, for a young couple with a, um, that are both artists who needed studio space in the garage space and then wanted to be able to rent out space above. So there are actually two rental units above that garage space. And this is increasingly um, possible with this ad uh, advance in terms of accessory dwelling units in um, California, which I think is uh, really should be a model throughout the country. Um, and particularly when you've got a corner lot like this, um, the two properties can be very independent. You don't even have to see the renters come and go. You can have your own orientation to one street and then have this additional higher density unit on the other. 
Um, the real breakthrough was deciding that housing people was more important than housing cars, which you would think would be pretty obvious in Los Angeles. We really don't need any housing for our cars. Uh, it never snows and uh, you know it's pretty easy to deal with uh, parking in the driveway instead of inside a structure. Um, so this is the project that I was talking about in terms of two units, two townhome units on one lot, and I wanted to use it to illustrate some of the kinds of things that are possible in new construction. Um, so this is the existing house. It was actually built in 1920, um, very flimsy, actually built of two by threes, if you can imagine, um, kind of by set designers actually at the adjacent movie theater, movie um, studios. So I think that they just didn't really prioritize permanence much. Um, so the new project actually provides two much larger homes on the same size lot um, by kind of fitting them together like a jigsaw. So uh, in the front here, there's a three bedroom, three bath um, home with the major compromise being that instead of that giant two-car garage, uh, which LA is uh, requiring even this day to this day, there's only a one-car garage. Um, and then in the back, there's a second unit with one-car garage and kind of um, oriented around its own courtyard. So this kind of shows how the two are oriented. One is T-shape and one is C-shape. They have lots of courtyard space because this is a dense little neighborhood, very close to downtown Culver City, if you're familiar with Los Angeles at all. Um, and um, the priority was really to provide the feeling of a single family home where you own the house and the ground, where you can plant stuff in the ground and where you can walk from your inside your house right onto the dirt very easily rather than condos or other types of higher density housing. So this is how the two units are kind of oriented, gives you a little diagram. And um, it's a pretty tight little puzzle. You'll notice that the, the stairs have to really wind around to get up there. Um, there's a lot of attention to energy efficiency and to durability. So having durable high quality materials, but particularly durable materials is a really important sustainability issue. So sometimes rather than, for example, um, wood, you might use in a window, you might use fiberglass. Okay, excellent from the point of view of energy efficiency, um, very, very durable, can hold up to our marine climate, our hot sun, and all sorts of other extremes of climate that you might have. Um, other materials that you see here include um, down on the bottom left, permeable pavers. They're cement pavers that allow the water to go through the paver and to recharge the groundwater um, so that we are uh, not having runoff, which picks up lots of pollutants, which goes straight into our ocean and pollutes the ocean. So increasingly durability, um, resistance to fire, um, resistance to, um, to all sorts of uh, wear and tear is important. So this is basically the cheapo stucco um, paneling. The, the project is envisioned as sort of first time home buyer. Still incredibly expensive given today's um, market, but it's, uh, it's accessible to the first time buyer at least. Um, this is kind of shows you how the two properties are fit together. So the front home is that fairly square lot. The other one has kind of a flag lot, long, um, long skinny thing that includes the garage and the driveway and then um, a back square piece. Um, this shows you how the, the house actually fits on the lot. It's a tight fit, as you can tell. One of the real innovations when you go to higher density like this is you really want to use balconies and uh, roof decks as much as possible to provide a whole array of different kinds of open space for people to use. 
So the roof decks have become increasingly important in projects like this, which are in more urban areas. And they allow you to grow vegetables, have access to, to sun, dry your clothes, um, and just in, enjoy the, the views actually of this area and the, the cool breezes as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about what, what the different green rating uh, systems actually look at. And this basically gives you the range. So when you have a report card, whether it's LEED or whether it's Greenpoint rated, you're looking at these variables. You're looking at how does this house use materials and resources as efficiently as possible. It'll save you money, it'll save on our trees, it'll save on other materials. Um, how does it protect indoor air quality? through filtration, through promoting ventilation. That's a very important thing for human health. And we basically had a, a giant seminar on that this past year as we dealt with the coronavirus. Um, how does it conserve water and how does it use water efficiently? That's both our landscaping and our appliances. Um, in terms of transportation and community, what we're really looking for is, is this housing close to jobs, schools, parks, and the other resources that we need access to in order to um, live well and efficiently with a minimum of um, gasoline being consumed to get you from one place to another. And then the final category is alternately called energy and atmosphere or energy efficiency, but that's really the crux of our big challenge right now, which is how do we use energy more efficiently um, and how do we avoid the, um, the consequences of uh, using fossil fuels and the terrible impacts they're, they're having on our environment. So the Build It Green uh, rating system has essentially the same categories as we just went through, resource conservation, air quality, water conservation, the community one, and energy efficiency. Um, the real wonderful thing about Greenpoint rating, which is now available across the country, is that it's relatively simple to document. And um, unlike LEED, which got a little carried away, I think, with some of the documentation, uh, and is sort of more adapted, honestly, to um, government buildings and commercial buildings. This one is easy for your architect and your contractor to actually document and make sure that they're actually complying with. And it gives you um, very good value for your money in, invested in the, the green rating process. The other thing that's interesting is in California, at least, and and in coastal um, areas, there, is, uh, there are real estate resale studies that show that people are willing to pay up to 9 or 10% more for a home that has a green point rating or a green rating of some kind. Um, I think increasingly people are caring about that issue, but they're also aware that, that in order to get that rating, you have to pay attention to some of the very same issues of quality construction that really matter for a homeowner. So in particular for insulation, for example, you can spend the exact same amount of money on the material and get a high quality home that will save you energy over 20 years or a lousy quality one um, merely by how much attention you pay to things that would show up on this rating system and would not on any other typical construction system. So this shows you how you kind of keep track of all of these things. You use a checklist uh, that looks at these different categories. You get points. In this particular example, I believe that, yes, this is the, the two townhome project. Um, it is uh, ready to get a uh, platinum level, which is the absolutely highest level. Um, essentially a net zero energy and close to net zero water home. Um, so you've got to pay attention, obviously, to things like where is the home located. You've got to make sure that it actually is feasible to get around by things other than driving huge distances. You've got to pay attention to energy efficiency. You want to have solar panels. You want to have all of these new technologies. 
um, increasingly you want to have the option for charging an electric car. In terms of air, indoor air quality, you want to look at the heat pump system, you want to have filtered ventilation, you want to make sure that you have ceiling fans for times when you don't want to turn on the air conditioning, and you want to have really high quality construction on that HVAC and insulation. And similarly with water conservation, you want to be paying attention to both the landscape and the interior fixtures to make sure they're as efficient as possible. You want to look at rainwater barrels or, or capturing and reusing. And just in terms of resources, and particularly right now when construction materials are so expensive, you want to be designing for efficiency. You want to use recycled or durable building materials, local ones if possible. You want, most importantly, to pay attention to making good use of land. No longer are we going to go out to the, you know, to the furthest farmland, hopefully, and build 5,000 houses. What we really need is those 5,000 homes to be inside existing developed areas. So um, money counts, resources counts. We have to pay attention to all of these things as we work together as a team. This is my team of all women designers to, to design the green homes of the future. Be happy to answer any questions you have and to talk to you about the specific uh, projects you might be working on. Hi there. Hi, Sandra. Um, I have the disadvantage of being in Alabama. Ah. So they're not ah. quite as supportive. <laughs> I have spent some time working on bicycle planning in Alabama and Georgia, and I understand what you're talking about. Um, you have a climate that really demands a lot of attention to these um, insulation and energy efficiency issues and potentially has, um, has opportunities definitely for solar although I know that sometimes the local utilities are less than uh, open to that. So one of the important um, fights is obviously to get our utilities to allow rooftop solar and to incentivize it instead of trying to block it or block net metering in some of the ways that people can actually sort of realize some of the, the savings. Um, but I, actually, I actually went to um, Montgomery um, to help fight about that. And uh, the good news was that the turnout was huge. Um, and what it was was Alabama Power making it much more difficult for people to um, have any kind of backup power. So, yeah, it, it's quite the battle here um, to get solar, but I'm hoping that current political climate will help that some. Yes, many of Biden's ideas are really that we should develop some of these technologies. Um, so, you know, electric cars, backup um, power storage, and uh, cheaper photovoltaic um, panels right here in our country. So a lot of this is actually linked to economic development. So hopefully people will get on board when they see some of the advantages. Um, Bill, did you have a question? Well, I wanted to comment to Sandra that uh, she is in Alabama is not alone in this kind of problem. Even in California, as we speak, the Public Utilities Commission is considering de-incentivizing rooftop solar in a very significant way. Um, <laughs> so now that said, the utilities as we knew them do face a very significant challenge to their business model. Uh, here in California, we have something called a CCA, a community choice aggregator system so that I can buy, as I do, 
supposedly 100% green power from the grid that is um, contracted for by a public uh, entity, in my case called Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So, you know, and it goes on and on. So there's a big question, I'm afraid, as to where the traditional public utility, in my case, Pacific Gas and Electric, is going to get its income <laughs> if it is going to continue as a for-profit corporation. And that's another good question. But I just, I, I don't really have another, I don't really have another question. I just wanted to point out that Alabama is not alone. <laughs> um, Allison, can you turn off share screen, please? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Let me find that. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to Anyways. do it. I couldn't do okay, it. Here. Okay, here. It, 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 it just helps migrating. us. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier to see who's who's participating. The, these issues are definitely um, continuing to be discussed. And, and California, which is far further along probably than any other state with possibly Massachusetts is in there and a few others, um, with promoting and, and developing renewable energy. You know, as you get more and more renewable energy, and particularly if it's um, either solar or wind, you do have to start to think about these issues of storage and how do you produce power on the off peak? Do you do it by shifting around and selling and, you know, to adjacent states, or do you use, um, you know, storage, storage dams, or do you develop these gigantic batteries, which we really don't have yet, but are, at some point we're going to need. Um, but it's really heartbreaking that in places um, like the South, where these things are completely viable and would save people a great deal and would probably help um, avoid tragedies like the, the incident in Texas, which was pretty much self-inflicted by having a very isolated electrical system with very poor preparation for extreme weather and um, disincentives to a lot of the more robust renewable and you know emergency backup storage and so on that could have helped them. Um, Bill. As um, you use involved in state action, you should know that there is an organization called ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, which has been promoting these bills in state legislatures to make uh, rooftop solar and other uh, home efficiency measures more expensive or more difficult. Uh, ALEC is founded by the Koch brothers, founded and funded by the Koch brothers. And you can see where they're coming from. We're threatening fossil fuel supplies, fossil fuel suppliers, by converting homes and other buildings to electrification. In uh, Washington state, where I'm on the State Action Network, uh, as a climate leader, we had fought the building electrification bill and it unfortunately failed because of the resistance of the gas industry. And you'll find that across the nation. We have to be aware of that and we have to build coalitions. By ourselves, we can't do it, not as you use, but in coalition, we can do a lot more. Um, I, I see a hand from Julie, followed by Suzanne. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I'm, I am thinking very seriously. I, I live outside of Pittsburgh, but one of my sons lives with his grown son with family, lives in southern New Hampshire, and has enough land that I could build a, um, uh, one of those units, the ADU. Um, I wondered, it, it's, it, it's wooded, it's very wooded, but I still think it's possible to, to put in solar panels and get some benefit from that. What, do you, do you have any thoughts on the climate and, and both, <laughs> both the 
actual climate and the political climate, et cetera, et cetera, in southern New Hampshire, and also um, thoughts on geothermal. Well, definitely one of the important things about, um, and kind of tricky things about um, green building across the country is it's not the same. Obviously, your, cl your local climate, um, availability of building materials, and all of that really weighs in to what's the best decision for any given um, location. Um, geothermal is definitely something I would look into there. Um, we, uh, I taught for a while in France and it was so interesting to see um, the very different approaches in different parts of France, which is a mm -hmm. pretty diverse uh, country in terms of climate. Um, what might, um, solar generally is, has become really quite inexpensive. So even without the kind of uh, subsidies that you can um, might see, you know, there's currently a little bit of a federal tax credit. Um, it actually makes some sense provided that you have good solar access and you have a certain amount of ongoing uh, electrical use, which you probably would if you're not going to put in gas um, appliances. So I, I forgot to mention those two townhomes, of course, being net zero, there's zero gas. There used to be gas to the site, we took it out. Um, so they're all 100% electric. Um, but geothermal makes a lot of sense in more extreme climates uh, like New Hampshire. Um, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I know that it gets really, really cold and it gets really, really hot. And um, so just kind of evening out the temperature swings um, with really, really good insulation and with um, geothermal um, or some similar kind of approach can be very, very powerful. And then you're just trying to work with getting it from that sort of stabilized temperature to whatever is a comfortable um, temperature. Uh, increasingly, even um, just having programmable thermostats or even, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Ecobee uh, thermostat, which is something that sort of learns from you about your, your patterns and which rooms you use when, um, and it can really basically optimize the use of your heating and cooling system in your home. So um, there's a lot of new technology that really helps us be much, much more energy efficient. So I would look into all of those things. Um, the really important thing, if you have a big site and it sounds like you have a big piece of land, um, I'm very envious. What well, it's, it's, it's about, I think it, the problem, it's a fairly large, I think several acres, I believe. But, it, but there's a lot of um, springs and vernal pools so oh, the actual, so we may be, which is wonderful. I think that's it. But um, it may be where I, we put this little house um, may be fairly constricted. Yes, and so the, the one of the really important things to do is really think through um, the orientation on the site, both so that you don't you know damage any of those those habitats that you've got all around you. Um, but also so that you're optimizing solar access at the right times of the year. Right. Um, so very important to do some studies um, on site of, of building orientation. Increasingly in our office, we use a 3D um, computer aided drafting system called Brevet mm -hmm. that allows us to um, basically to draw the building in three dimensions, but then to actually study it as the sun moves around um, throughout the year and throughout the day and really understand when is this area gonna be in, in shade? When, it, when are we gonna get plenty of sun? Um, how much of an overhang do we want here so that in the summer we don't get too hot and in the winter we get nice and warm from the sun. So, um, I'd say spend plenty of time looking at those issues of exactly how you orient it to the site, get a nice topo study, yeah. um, get it digitized and have somebody working with you who can look at the three-dimensional aspects of um, the house on the site and how it relates to all those um, natural features. What was and, the, and uh, Suzanne, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, just, I just wanna make sure Suzanne gets her question in. Yeah, um, just the name of the uh, well, the drawing program that you use. Oh, R-E-V-I-T. -R Thank you. 
Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Suzanne. Well, my question was, I'm in a 110-year-old house, and um, it needs, well, actually, it's got lead paint that no one will remove. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking, well, I've heard the best option is to wrap it. And, and so I'm thinking, well, I think now's an opportunity to put you know, different siding on and insulation. So how do you evaluate what are um, green options in that way? Because of course, everyone claims that, you know, like, yeah, vinyl siding is really your best green option. It's like, um, I don't think so. Um, but, you know, what, what is a good way of evaluating, you know, I mean, you talked about location and mm -hmm. all, but, you know, I'm, I'm in Montana, I'm, everything's going to have to be shipped in. So I don't know that that makes a whole lot of difference. So just some advice in that area. Well, you know, there are often trade-offs you have to make in life and in building a lot. And the biggest one is cost, obviously, but, um, but also in terms of safety, your priority with lead paint is you want to keep it in very good condition. You want to make sure that it is not peeling and and flaking off and getting into it is, the soil. It is peeling. It is peeling and chipping off. So okay, yeah. So that's a that's a tough one, and um, it's a kind of perverse situation we have where, yes, it's sustainable to to save these old houses, but it is quite difficult now that we're really paying attention to lead paint, and for a long time we didn't. Um, to find people who are willing to do the work, but there are some out there um, and it's well worth it to you to get a properly trained person in there to take care of that paint that is loose and flaking because that's a hazardous material to, um, to uh, scrape it or to remove it as much as it, you know, it can be. And then, um, you know, just, actually painting it again can sometimes encapsulate it, you know, if you've done good prep work. Um, so that might be the best solution, um, but you really want to do some research on your climate, your issues, um, and, and um, with a very good lead paint trained contractor, properly certified and who speci specializes in that work. And I, they can be expensive, but it's, it's like dealing with asbestos, you have to do it. Um, the, it's true that you could uh, use vinyl siding and especially in your kind of harsh climate, it might make some sense. Um, aluminum siding or vinyl siding have been used a lot in harsh climates like that. Um, and that, that would have the sort of side benefit of encapsulating the lead paint so that you don't have an ongoing issue of it kind of heating up, flaking off and falling into the ground. So worth, worth looking at the trade-offs and the costs and talking with the experts on, in your area to figure out you know, which is the best solution for your particular project. Um, but I, you know, one of the advantages of things like vinyl and aluminum is they're relatively lightweight. So they're sometimes easier to transport and to install and so on. So without knowing all the details, basically you need to find your local experts and learn from them and spend some time looking at the options. Good luck. Okay, Thank you. well, um, so, so um, it's, we're, we're on the half hour. Um, I, I think though we, we can manage one more question for Allison if there are any. I see Gary, Gary lifted yes. his finger. <clears throat> I did, uh, thank you. I uh, just sent a message to Allison asking her if she would comment on uh, the use of steel containers for housing. I'm seeing some really creative stuff and um, I know it's not for everybody, but uh, it may be a wise use of the steel that's just going to rot away if you don't use it. Mm -hmm. I'll shut up. Yeah, there's there's been some interesting um, work on use of uh, steel containers as in container ship shipping containers. 
Um, one of the problems with them that was um, being pointed out at a seminar I just went to yesterday is, is that they're often um, eight foot wide, which is a kind of really constrained size mm. for most housing. Um, so they kind of might work for, you know, here in Los Angeles where we have a gigantic port and we have a gigantic homelessness problem. They can be kind of, you know, um, particularly appropriate there, but this was actually a, um, a modular housing solution for emergency housing in uh, urban settings. And the, the architect who was speaking said, you know, really what you want is a module that's more like 12 feet wide, which has the advantage of still being able to be transported on, um, on a truck over roadways um, and is less constrained than an absolutely solid, you know, steel container in terms of mod in being able to be modified and, and um, be kind of as efficient as possible in terms of the material. So although you can definitely use sh shipping containers and some people have, um, whether they're the ideal um, for sus sustainable environmentally sound housing is a little unclear. What is very clear is that modular and prefab housing could be much more widely available and much more energy and uh, resource efficient than the kind of really sort of crazy outmoded way we build now, which is, you know, um, super inefficient, requires a lot of waste and a lot of um, expensive labor on site. So more prefabrication and more modular features, absolutely. Whether it's shipping containers, whether it's something a little bit different, could be very important. Sorry, Doris, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah I am <laughs> muted. I, I am. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Allison. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's, yes, we're all, all these muted people are clapping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it was fascinating. Um, I, I well, I I always love learning more about buildings, building design, and um, being a retired government employee. Lead has always been. Um, I've always held lead in high esteem. So I've been. I was interested in your comments on that. So be, because this is a series about drawdown and all of the solutions that are part of drawdown and buildings. <clears throat> and the way we put our, our housing and our offices on the land and use our resources is such a huge contributing part. I want to make sure that the people participating are aware of how to learn more, especially through Drawdown, since that's what this initiative is all about right now. Um, so, for those who, who are already part of uh, a team, um, helping, work, working within our organization to take actions, you find this by going to your dashboard. Um, some of you saw this at the beginning of the presentation. Some of you are seeing it, it new now. So you're on your dashboard. I'm, I've logged in. I'm, I go to my dashboard. I go to resources. This is a really strange path to find this information, but nevertheless, it is what it is. So under resources, you go to event info, and it says, welcome to Drawdown Eco Challenge. Explore challenges, explore all solutions. So here we are now looking at the table of solutions, and it ranks all of these drawdown solutions over here. Right now they're in alphabetical order. Um, and, dip, and like for instance, if we looked at scenario two um, and clicked on that and got it in order, um, what you're looking at, 147.72, uh, is the contribution of reduced gigatons of CO2 that onshore wind turbines would provide. So you can see, you know, I'm, I'm scrolling through real fast. 
but you can see that there's all kinds of solutions listed. For now, I'm going back to um, what we've been talking about today, building retrofitting, because I want everybody to see that finding more information about all this, about every, every one of the drawdown solutions is really pretty easily accessible just by going to the solutions page, pulling up a fact sheet and, um, you know, just a, it's, a, it's a quick way to learn more. So, um, so anyway, I'm just scrolling around a little bit, letting you see how easily you can find some, an overview of the information. Um, okay, with that, thank Allison so much. I have um, sustainable development goal pins that I'm sending out as a thank you gift. They're lapel pins that have, you know, the sustainable development goal colorful wheel as a thank you gift for being one of our guest speakers. So we'll be in touch and I'll, I'll get your home address and get that little gift out to you. Um, with My name is Barb. I'm coming to you from Auburn, California, member of Social Justice Committee and Mission Earth at Sierra Foothills Unitarian Universalist. Good to be here. Gary. Look forward to it, Allison. <laughs> yes. Gary. Myself, uh, yes. Um, I'm Gary Mart, uh, former member of All Souls um, and Green Souls in Washington. Um, I now am in Danbury, Connecticut. The uh, congregation of Danbury, and I'm the local greenie. We like Glad you. We we like all the local greenies. <laughs> Wonderful, Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne Reimer. I'm with Billings Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and uh, um, we've been trying to have green sanctuary for quite some time. But I'm here more for personal reasons because I'm trying to do some upgrading for my house and I would like to do it in a green fashion. That, that's the plan. Bill. <laughs> uh, Bill Hil Hilton. Hi, I'm Bill Hilton. I am an active member of the UU Church of Palo Alto, California. Uh, and the current um, chair or leader of a task force that our board has recently commissioned for the church to become carbon neutral by 2030. Thank you, thank you. Um, Allison, do you wanna introduce now and then have me do my drawdown or introduce sure. all at once? Okay. Sure. So um, this is just to give you just an overview of where our collective actions stand. So first of all, all of you can get to this, okay? Um, from your dashboard once you log in. So right now I'm just going to go to people and our, not our team, which some, some, some are part of individual teams within our main organization, which is UUDD 2021. And if you go there, put in UUDD 2021 and hit search, you will see um, let me make this bigger, that we are, we, we have moved up from like the bottom of the barrel all the way to number six in rank, oh, in rank of points. Unfortunately, we, I, I don't foresee us ever getting to number one because the number one has like 200,000 points. And, you know, the number two has maybe 50,000. I think we can get to number two, but not number one. Um, 260 members. So, so that's a quick, quick snapshot of how um, things are, things are moving along. Um, <clears throat> we don't care about points. We don't care about people. We care about how well we are uh, taking action to combat climate change. So you click on impacts. You can see what pops up first is how everyone who is participating in the Eco Challenge is doing. And if you, I, I won't 
go into all of these, but um, essentially this is the quick overview of what is logged for everyone. But what is logged for us, um, wow, we just, we, our actions just increased by 61 just today. Earlier today it was 3450, now we're already at 3511. Um, and you can, everybody can get to this page and let's just say, all right, plastic containers not sent to the landfill, 44. That is so lame for 260 people. We, we can do better there. We can do better on some of these. Um, but what we will be doing today is, um, where'd it go? We will be increasing our minutes spent learning, okay? 